Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Ian Robinson, Vice President of Programs and International Operations for the International Fund for Animal Welfare. The International Fund saves animals in need around the world. With projects in more than 40 countries, IFAW rescues individual animals, campaigns to prevent animal cruelty, and advocates for the protection of wildlife and habitats. Ian has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Ian, for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. So how did you get into the field of animal welfare? Well, I'm a veterinarian by training, and animal welfare was always uh, an interest, and in particular, wildlife was a great passion. Um, for many years, I was in general practice and worked pro bono for animal rehabilitators, helping to get wildlife back into the wild. And after a period of time, an opportunity came up to do that full time, and I realized that that was my passion, and that's the route I should follow. And general practice, uh, where and, and what type of animals did you... Uh, did you treat? Have you ever heard of James Herriot, read the James Herriot books? No, I haven't. In England. Um, uh, he was an author who wrote about the north of England, um, Yorkshire, uh, many years ago. I was in practice in that same area, um, and it's an old-fashioned, very much family farming area, uh, small dairy farms, sheep farms, uh, with a, a small number of companion animals. And uh, that was the, the work I did for about a little over 10 years. Um, and as I say, the, the wildlife was always my hobby and, and my passion. I'm a, a, a rather a fanatical bird watcher mm -hmm. and, uh, and always interested in, in the concept of being able to take the animals which suffer usually from their contact with people right. um, and, and become casualties and returning those back into the wild to live a full life. How did you end up making the transition from being in private practice uh, to doing this full time uh, as part of a nonprofit. The turning point for me came in uh, 1988, uh, mm -hmm. and in that year there was a large uh, mass mortality of seals in the North Sea. Uh, something like 30,000 harbor seals died in the North Sea in a period of just a few months. And I was a volunteer during that outbreak, helping with the, the casualties, uh, the, the seals which arrived still, still sick and, and needing help. And that made me realize that if I really wanted to do wildlife properly, it needed to be full time. So you witnessed this, this mass die off. You were uh, part of a volunteer uh, brigade uh, treating uh, the, these animals. Mm -hmm. And that awakens within you a desire to take this next step, but mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you make that transition? First, uh, the decision I had to make was to sell my practice. That is a, a huge a, step. It's a considerable step, yes. And, and, yeah. and you mm -hmm. have actually spent all of your life up till that point preparing yourself for that practice. It was really a decision of did I spend the rest of my life working in the Yorkshire Dales in this practice which I had developed, or did I change direction completely and try and uh, concentrate and make a career in the uh, non-profit world uh, working uh, with wildlife. And I made the decision that uh, that's, that's what I wanted to do. And also some serendipity because at the same time uh, the RSPCA, Royal Society for um, Prevention of Cruelty to Animals in the UK, following the uh, the mortality in seals had decided to create a, a wildlife hospital specifically for the purpose of uh, rehabilitating British wildlife, concentrating on the seals but also taking a wide range of other species. And so uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to link up with the RSPCA and to, um, uh, to become the manager of that hospital when it opened. The RSPCA had always cared deeply about wildlife but the work that was done was more on, on an ad hoc basis, often with uh, small, what you might call backyard rehabilitators, right. uh, private individuals who would take an animal into their home and would rehabilitate it and release it back into the wild. And there was a realization that, that rehabilitation is, is more than that. Uh, there is actually science behind it. It's not just something that comes from the heart and, and right. animals need more than just love and nursing. They actually need uh, proper veterinary care uh, and they need proper nursing which takes into account uh, 
their natural behavior and the needs that they'll have once they go back into the wild. In yeah. terms of, of the next several years, you spent the next several years managing this, this facility? Yes, uh, and the facility grew to um, a hospital taking in over 6,000 wildlife casualties every year of some 200 different species and releasing those to the wild. Uh, we were based um, on seals as, as perhaps our, our core species, if you like, uh, in Norfolk where the virus originally had been the worst, uh, although it had long passed and what we were dealing with now were casualties from all sorts of reasons, uh, but also involving uh, a lot of birds, particularly oiled wildlife as we're in a coastal uh, situation, and land mammals as well. And, and how did you end up coming from the Royal Society to IFAW? Two things, I think one, a desire to expand to a greater range of species and to look at uh, uh, rehabilitation in the context of, um, of, the, of the, the world, uh, internationally, different, uh, different areas, different regions, different species. Also, as I was rehabilitating each individual animal, I was becoming aware of two things. One, that they needed that habitat to go back into. Mm -hmm and the other that they are actually a window into that habitat. So those seals which died in the virus crisis uh, were not only individual casualties, but they were also telling us something about the environment that they came out of, the threats to that environment. And by rescuing those animals, caring for them, but also diagnosing their problems and researching deeper into how those uh, threats affect them, you can learn so much about the environment. And these environments are also the environments from which we draw food. They're the mm -hmm. environments that refresh our atmosphere. Mm -hmm. This is not simply, and if it were simply about preservation of mm -hmm. species, it is arguably an eminently worthy cause, but it is not simply about the preservation of other species, it's about our own self-preservation. It is, and there's a growing concept uh, which it's called One Welfare. Um, you might have heard of a concept called One Health, where we look at the health of animals, wildlife, domestic animals, people, and the planet, and realize that they're all tied together. The health of, of wildlife, the health of, of individual people, and the health of the whole planet are all linked. And you can't really take any one piece and look at it in isolation. You need to look at the interaction between all of those pieces. In the same way, welfare, the welfare of wildlife, the welfare of the domestic animals that we, that we keep, the welfare of ourselves, they're all interlinked. And it's impossible to really separate one thing from the other. You need to take the whole lot as, as a picture. In terms of the work that, that the International Fund for Animal Welfare uh, executes, could you give us a, a brief overview of the scope, the international scope, and also the programmatic scope of your work? As far as the programmatic scope of our work goes, we believe that animals have intrinsic value. Each individual animal counts. And we believe that in order to be able to preserve the habitat and the population, you also have to take notice of the individual animal. So we try to take a holistic approach where we, we consider everything from the rescue and rehabilitation of individual animals, through the restoration of habitat and the preservation of habitat, through to uh, changing the hearts and minds of people to ensure that they um, protect and respect animals uh, as individuals, and also that there is legislation and enforcement in place uh, to protect those animals. In many respects, isn't this also a matter of mindful stewardship? in which you are treating animals as representatives of the species as well as beings in and of themselves. Absolutely. And often the story of the individual animal will help very much to bring home to people uh, the needs of the population, the needs of the habitat, and, and the needs of the greater environment. So in terms of, of how you interact with others, is the uh, organization uh, part advocacy or uh, and part programmatic 
politically oriented, or is it um, does it have an ambassadorial type function? Yes, we we are um, a mix of a hands-on project on the ground. Um, so and scientists, volunteers, staff, and so on, actually working on projects. Yes, absolutely. Uh, for example, the uh, uh, Southern Africa uh, project, uh, taking the science coming um, coming out of, of really pure research, mm -hmm. uh, which reveals how and what elephants do, where they move, what their needs right. are, um, to then the the hands-on projects which try and preserve those, um, to the advocacy with the countries involved to try and persuade them to uh, to support uh, the preservation of those lands and then to police those, to, to provide the enforcement which actually uh, gives the, um, uh, the, the protection, the teeth it needs to be successful. How do you mitigate the risk of being viewed as outsiders coming from other countries and, and trying to be prescriptive or even being um, uh, moralistic and scolding mm. um, with, uh, with counterparts in other countries that have priorities um, that might not align with, with yours? As far as our staff are concerned, our staff in the 15 country offices are by and large staff from those countries or at least staff from those regions. So we have local people who have local knowledge uh, and who interact with, uh, with their governments and uh, with uh, their communities uh, because they come from those communities. And they're intrinsically motivated. Their, their motivations are their own. They, they are, um, are um, attaching themselves to you because your approach aligns with theirs uh, coming from an on-the-ground on experience in those countries. Absolutely. They're advocates for animals everywhere. In every country in the world, there are advocates for animals. Culturally, the way that that is expressed might be a little different from one region to another, but uh, as far as recruiting our advocates and recruiting our, uh, uh, our on-the-ground scientific staff, uh, then really you can find people who are passionate about animal welfare and conservation in any country in the world. How does funding actually work? You have an international operation. It is quite expensive mm -hmm. to, to run that. And then there are also the different laws about how um, you can raise funds and also how you can spend those funds. Mm. Our funding mainly comes from the public, from public who are, again, passionate about animals, uh, varying from uh, people who just give a few dollars to, uh, to major donors, and we mainly raise our funds within Britain, Europe, to a lesser extent the US and Australia. Uh, and a lot of that money is spent in countries like Asia, or regions like Asia and, and Africa. We do, uh, we do projects also in the countries where we raise funds. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's fairly unique about I4 is we have one board. So although we have 15 country offices, we have a number of different legal entities. Uh, we deal in a range of different currencies around the world. But we have one board. So we have uh, one overarching strategic plan uh, and one set of guiding principles which guides every country office. In terms of, of the composition of your board, since you are doing work in so many different countries, is your, is your board also quite international? It is quite international. It really largely is drawn from our fundraising countries, but we also do have members from some of our project countries, for example, Kenya. Mm -hmm. um, so we do try and maintain a balance um, of board members from uh, from around the world uh, and from representatives of the, of the different regions in which we work. What, is, what are the plans for the future? Are you going to try to continue to replicate what you're doing in different locations? Are you thinking about expanding? Or, or are you thinking of doing what the Royal Society did so many years ago, of moving into other areas of endeavor? 
there are so many things that need doing, it's impossible to do them all. Right. We've been in a significant global recession for some time now, and many NGOs, including ourselves, have found this quite a taxing period. Uh, and one of the things that we've discovered during this period is really that we need to diversify our fundraising. Mm -hmm. So although the majority of our money still comes from the individual donor who is passionate about animals, we are trying to expand into the area of raising funds from governments, from uh, foundations, and uh, also perhaps uh, more from uh, major donors, from people of significant wealth who have a passion for a particular subject. Uh, and this is leading us into a, a, a route of expansion. Uh, we feel really this is the key to, to our expansion. So as the world moves on, male traditional mail is becoming less important, right. the internet is becoming more important. And so those are changing the ways that we, we raise funds. And also uh, to be able to raise funds from a diversified uh, stream of, uh, of funders uh, is very important for our, our future. Now that requires another shift in your business model as, as the organization develops. Are you reinvesting in in fundraising and in marketing and in communications, um, or is that still something for the future? No, we are very definitely uh, investing in, uh, in fundraising and in communications, although this is not a specifically a fundraising example. Um, in China, we have been advertising in subways mm -hmm. uh, to try and persuade Chinese people to reject ivory as a product, to show them that it, it's connected with cruelty. And ivory actually comes from elephants that are killed. This is something that actually research showed that many people in China didn't understand. Right. When we did uh, our evaluation of that, uh, we found it had been tremendously successful. But actually, a lot of the people had not found out about it through simply seeing the advertisement we placed in the subway, but through social media because people who had seen it had shared it with them on Twitter, on the, the Chinese equivalent of Twitter, and through social media. So it shows that social media can have this huge synergistic effect, uh, and uh, it's something which we're, we're very keen to exploit in the future. Another one of our clients, WildAid, has had tremendous success in reducing um, the, cons uh, the consumption of of shark fin soup mm -hmm. in China mm -hmm. with a really dramatic impact mm -hmm. on shark populations. Mm -hmm. So this is a very, very powerful means if it can be leveraged in a cost-effective way, in a sustainable way, to try and get the demand side shifted. Mm -hmm. Indeed, and in looking at these markets, they're very complex. You, you have to look at the effect of the the supply, mm -hmm. the um, the value the chain, trade. the whole logistics, yeah, yeah. and then and then the demand side. To just attack one side alone, to just try and protect, for example, elephants uh, from being poached for their ivory, without looking at how that ivory is trafficked, how it is moved from one continent to another, and how it reaches the end consumer, um, or to look at it without taking in, into account the consumer demand will fail. We need to attack each of those three components of the trade if we're to have any success in, in preserving elephants for the future. Well, Ian Robinson, thank you so much for sharing your experience with us. Thank you for your great work at this wonderful organization, the International Fund for Animal Welfare, and thank you for your insights. Thank you very much.